talking about the remnants of the temple. And we ended up with this little gold bell, which was the on the skirts uh, of the high priest, right? Bells and pomegranates. And in fact, um, if you think about it, there are um, a couple of sartorial details that are mentioned in the Torah, um, uh, how people should dress, in other words. And, um, and those bells and those skirts and that uniform, so to speak, are, are, um, comprises one unit in uh, that, that uh, sartorial direction of the Torah. But we'll get to that eventually. I want to start by posing uh, three questions uh, that I posed to my students when I asked them to think about the question of how you identify a Jew, particularly in art, since we deal with visual culture, right? So I asked the students to describe three, um, uh, three physical characteristics of Jewish people that are not generalizations um, or stereotypes. And then I tell them if they can't do this, explain why, right? And of course they can't do it because the difficulty of characterizing Jews in a visual manner will be obvious to us in a second. Um, and the question then becomes, well, how in art could we best characterize Jews, right? That is uh, without uh, you know, um, the money bags, the hook noses, uh, the hunchbacks and the mean avaricious expressions, right? If we wanted to avoid the negative stereotype. Um, the problem is, how would you characterize all Jews, right? How would you show them as being Jewish? Um, and the problem is that uh, Jews are very diverse. I don't know why it says a group of up there. Please ignore that. Um, it's clearly, clearly from something, something else. Um, uh, but you know, all these people and I'm showing you right now are Jews, for instance. Uh, and it's a question how we would um, depict Jews. Jews, uh, as I've often said, uh, are like tofu, it's supposed to be blank, just uh, bear with me. Jews are like tofu. Wherever you put a Jew in that culture, right, the Jews absorb the culture and they reflect the culture. I'm, I'm dressed right now in a way that's not particularly characteristic of Jews, except perhaps for one or two details. And um, we have to think about the fact that Jewish clothes responded to circumstances, historical circumstances, experiential circumstances in two ways. One way was to help Jews assimilate to the society in which they live, right? This is a, a Cuba Vera shirt, right? It's a linen shirt. It's, um, it's, uh, it's you know, uh, one could buy it on the internet or in stores. It's not particularly Jewish garb. So that makes me part of a wide community of people who are wearing, let's say, Cuba Vera shirts, right? Um, or people who like the color, et cetera. Um, my eyeglasses, right? But I am wearing a kippah, right? So that is a distinctive mode of Jewish dress that distinguishes me from other people and identifies me as a Jew. So the way Jewish dress worked historically from biblical times was both to assimilate Jews to the culture in which they lived and to distinguish them. As you might imagine, the Torah is interested particularly in distinctions, which means that the ways in which Jews looked like the society around them is erased or invisible in the Torah. We don't, we see references to cloaks or uh, tunics or garments or uh, turbans occasionally, um, but we're not prescribed any particular kind of dress except that dress that distinguishes Jews. So if you think about that scene, which I'm not showing you at the moment because I've shown it in other contexts from Annie Hall, where Woody Allen, who's dressed like a normal person, right, is seated at the table with all the wasp relatives of Annie and the grandmother, who's a real Fabicina, uh, Granny Hall, looks across the table and sees Woody Allen with a beard and payas and a black hat, et cetera, right? Um, those are things that distinguish Jews. And when we think about Jewish dress, we 
I often think about more traditionally observant Jews, more conservative dress, and very often men. And what I want to do today is to start with a discussion without illustration um, of biblical parameters around dress, talk a little bit about dress in Jewish law, and then proceed to jump over my normal um, scope of interest, which is the Middle Ages. I'm not gonna show any manuscripts tonight. I'm not gonna talk about any modes of historical dress. I'm basically gonna show you clothing that we have in surviving examples. That is basically from the 18th century through today. That is clothes that Jews, wherever they lived in the Jewish world, east, west, north, south, wore, preserved, and eventually, because this is going to be the major focus of what I show you, um, donated uh, to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem to become part of the ethnographic collections there. So I'm going to end with ethnography, which means a study of mostly contemporary or let's say late modern to contemporary Jews and the actual clothes they wore. But well, let's think for a second about clothes in the Bible. In the Bible, everybody's naked at the beginning, right? And um, that's why they're told to be fruitful and multiply, not to be um, fruitless and divide, right? <laughs> and one of the very first things that, that um, Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve do when they become conscious of their nakedness is to sew together garments made of fig leaves. This is the original vegan costume. You know, now people have vegan leather shoes, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this was, it's interesting that, that it is not um, animal skins that they wear, but, uh, but, 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 uh, but uh, clothes made uh, from vegetable material. Um, the next time we have a sort of significant discussion of clothes is all the way um, in the book of Exodus. Clothes are mentioned uh, throughout the book of Genesis in various uh, um, uh, configurations, but they are uh, legislated in the book of Exodus. And the book of Exodus says a couple of things about clothes and sartorial details. One is that if you have a garment that has four corners, that is a square or rectangular garment with a hole for your head, right? You are required to put fringes on the corners of the garment. They're sometimes called tzitzit. In other places, they're called gedilim. It's not entirely clear what these are. Jewish law later legislated them to have specific configurations of knots and strings, and they specifically were intended to remind one of the number of commandments in the Torah or of the name of God so that one would be surrounded by these when one wore a four-cornered garment. Of course, it says nothing about any other kinds of garments, except that the fabric of your garment should not be made of wool and linen mixed together. That is uh, the products of the field and the products of um, uh, the, the barnyard mixed together. That's somehow an improper mixture with one significant exception. The high priest in the temple wore a garment of mixed wool and linen. This is always the case that the temple was a space of exceptionality so that you couldn't make a golden or silver or earthen statue in three dimensions and put it in a worship context. But in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, on the ark, there were the Kruvim. Nobody was worshiping the Kruvim, we hope, but it would be according to the second commandment, which says you should not make a three-dimensional image to bow down in worship, it's, it, it, <laughs> there's two parts of that. You should not make a three-dimensional image in order to bow down and worship it. It could certainly be argued that the Kruvim were not made for worship, but it's kind of dicey. So the temple is a place in which there are exceptions, but no wool and linen and fringes on garments. And then some other sartorials that men are not to round the corners of their face, which is interpreted uh, eventually as shaving with a razor and the necessity of leaving seven parts of the face, one, two, uh, three, four, I don't know what the whole seven are, but beard, mustache, and sideburns, right? Maybe the corners of the sideburns add up uh, untouched, right? That is very, very little and gives very, very great latitude so that all the later 
sartorial details, sartorial means clothing details, such as women shouldn't wear pants, right, um, come in much, much later and only, I stress this, only come in in certain places in certain societies. So at the end of the presentation, I should have called that section women with pants, you know, we'll see some Jewish societies in which very, very religiously observant women, religiously observant because they didn't have any choice. There wasn't any reform Judaism. There was just traditional Judaism. Traditionally, their garment was pants, right? Uh, not so in Ashkenazi Jewry, Jew but certainly in some Mizrahi, that is Eastern uh, Jewries. So if I was to take a look ethnographically in the early 20th century, at a group of Yemenite Jewish children here uh, and a mother with a baby. They're, everybody's tiny, so you know, it's hard to tell the daughters from the mothers. And in fact, in Yemen, Afghanistan, and you know, Iraq, um, and sometimes Iran, um, girls were betrothed very, very early, sometimes at nine or sometimes at 12. It doesn't mean that they were um, married in, in a technical sense or having sexual relations at that age, but it means that they were, um, they were considered as married women. They were in uh, promise to particular men. This is to keep families together. And so we'll see, uh, we'll see a number of uh, effectively children decked out in bridal costume as we continue. But this is the daily costume of Jews in Yemen. And what's interesting about it is that it reflects the general Yemenite use on a certain level. And yet in certain details, the peyot, there are two Jewish groups that grow their sideburns very long, Hasidim and Yemenite Jews. And this actually caused a very interesting conjunction later in history where Satmar Jews um, uh, were involved in some cases in kidnapping Yemenite Jews to um, uh, prevent them from ending up in Israel where it was feared they would be secular. Uh, and, and Yemenite Jews growing up in Satmar communities in New York, it was a whole scandal in the 50s, 60s, 70s. It might still go on today. Very few Jews left in Yemen. But why was the Satmar community drawn to and interested in Yemenite Jews who are Arabic speaking Jews, whose culture is completely different from their own, right? Because the men wear long side locks and that was enough to, to create this affinity. So clothes and, and styles of hair are very, very uh, important connecting factors. So whereas the clothing of the women with these hoods, with these fringes, and if you were a married woman, you, sometimes you had your entire dowry on your head or around your neck, all the gold that you own, would distinguish these, would not distinguish these people, they would look like other people. But you notice that the, the boy is wearing a talet, right? And, and Yemenite Jews sometimes wore the talet for purposes other than synagogue or liturgical purposes. It was, it was a cloak, right? And as a cloak, it needed to have fringes on it, which you see, right? So there are, these people would be quickly identified as Jews. Uh, on the other hand, there are aspects of their clothing that belong to the general society. Now, this is, um, this is very interesting in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. So here we have a woman who's very, very covered up and a young girl who, whose face is seen and veiling practices among Jews is an interesting question. We'll talk about it as we go along. But here's a man standing here, we see him in the back in this 1940s photo, wearing a standard garment uh, worn by both Muslims and Jews, but Jews as dimis, as second class citizens because of religion in Morocco, wore the same thing that Muslims wore, but you can see here that the cloak is inside out to mark them as Jews. So here is uh, one of these cloaks. Uh, here it's turned the correct way, but it wouldn't be seen in this way. It would be inside out. So one of the ways in which you mark Jews, we're all, we're all um, unfortunately familiar with uh, time later in history when Jews were marked with badges and yellow stars beginning in the Middle Ages in 1214 and then repeated uh, during the National Socialist re Regime in each of the countries in which they, um, they, they held sway. So in Germany, in 
um, Holland in France. Uh, my father-in-law still has his Hungarian stars uh, in a, in a, in a, um, in a drawer in their house in Budapest. Um, even when you dressed your most elegantly for your wedding day, uh, the star was, was required. And that's one way, of course, of marking Jews. But another way is taking a garment that is present for everyone, Jews and Muslims or Jews and Christians in society, and enforcing the wearing of it in a, in a, in a, um, in a strange, literally here, backwards, inside out way. One thing that we know about uh, when we uh, see Jews is that Jews wear hats. Uh, men of all ages and married women, and in some Jewish societies, even girls, cover the head. This is something that is in fact subjective and subject to variation, right? So we read about Jews in Spain, in Barcelona, in the 1300s going to see the king, right? And, um, and going bareheaded as a measure of respect. Right? Jews in Italy were notorious for not covering their heads at certain times and periods because that was considered respectful. A person who came with a head covered in an inner space, an interior space, was regarded as a boor. So Leon Modena, for instance, who was um, the rabbi of Venice, in the 1600s, very important and interesting uh, figure about whom I am attempting to write a novel. Um, I've written four sentences, just in case you are uh, wondering. Leon Modena, who was a fan of tennis, um, an inveterate gambler, um, had a lot of tragedy in his life and introduced polyphonic choral singing uh, to the Venice synagogue, also wrote one of the first known Jewish biographies, autobiographies, I should say. And on the title page, he commissioned a small etching of himself with a bare head, because that was what was respectful. But when we think about um, Jews, uh, we often think about Jews uh, with head covers, right? So this is uh, men of the Slonim family uh, in Hebron uh, wearing uh, streimels, which is a particular type of Hasidic hat. Uh, you may know that it is worn by Hasidim, but it owes its, it has its origins in the costume of the nobility in Poland um, in, in the uh, 18th century. Um, by the time Jews retain it, and Jews often retain some uh, form of garment that shows them as a royal or privileged or specially chosen people, by the time Jews are wearing it, it has fallen into desuetude. That it is, that is, it is out of style um, in you know um, among uh, poles. Right, poles are already dressing in an enlightened fashion, so it's kind of retro <laughs> in a positive way for the Jews, maybe in a negative way for others who think it's silly and mock it. But what you may or may not know is that there were um, several forms of of the streimel. So uh, this is, um, this is uh, what you would call a streimel um, because it has foxtails that radiate around a central velvet um, uh, kippah, sometimes a high peaked kippah, and they sort of stick out. So these guys um, are not technically wearing streimels. They're wearing something um, called uh, the kolpik, which is this, a smoother exterior. Right, and then there's something called a spodik, which is a um, uh, a higher hat with more levels of fur. Um, it's you know streimels and spodiks and kolpiks were given um, uh, mystical interpretations, uh, but they are basically um, practical because they keep the head warm, uh, and impractical because if you wear it in New York in the summer or Jerusalem in the summer. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit crazy, right? It can boil your brain. And uh, sometimes people with strimals uh, behave as if their brains have been boiled. Um, uh, but uh, it, but uh, the political comments aside, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it is a very distinctive form of dress, but it's not universal. It is not distinctive um, within Judaism because there are many types of hats, as you can see from this Baghdadi rabbi's turban, right? that um, involve a central core, which is just the yarmulke, with some kind of enhancement. So the fur on the streimel serves as 
an enhancement. It 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 um, it projects the extra piety of the uh, of the wearer. And this rabbi's hat is interesting. It comprises a fez, which would be a normal headgear in Baghdad for everybody from laborers up. But this is a fez made of felt with a special tassel on it, and then around it a turban like one would see uh, Muslims wearing it, except it is yellow in color and yellow was reserved for Jews. Jews could not wear white, they could not wear green, two colors of Islam in their headgear, but yellow was for them. And you see the morphological, the shape similarity between the turban far east in Baghdad and the strimals, um, East Europe, right? Um, but, the varieties of Jewish headgear are simply astounding because <laughs> normally Jewish headgear is just normal headgear kicked up a notch, right? So a turban with a special tassel or a hat with, um, with eight sides that you could see on the head of priests, right? Adopted as a cantorial hat for Jews, right? Or again, a fez with something around it and a tassel. So again, we are adopting the dress that is around us, and we are adapting it to say something about the nobility of Jews or the specialness of Jews. Now, how do ultra-Orthodox Jews dress? Well, you know, um, uh, I've heard ultra-Orthodox Jews referred to as penguins, which means uh, they dress in black and white. They dress in black and white. Um, and that is true. Uh, but the people on the bottom here are as ultra-Orthodox as the people on the top. The people on the top are sans Hasidim, sorry, sans Hasidim, uh, yeshiva scholars uh, listening to a discourse of the Rebbe in B'nai Brak. And the people on the bottom are rabbis wearing turbans and white garments in Baghdad, Iraq. So you know, uh, would you, could, could we say that the, the sans Hasidim are more quote unquote religious, more observant? No, it's a matter of East and West. And it's a matter of what is considered to be dignified and holy. And for the Baghdadi Jews, it was white, which meant that you were of a status where you could, you were sitting and learning all day. That showed that you were sitting and learning all day, because if you were slogging around in the mud and shit and dust of the marketplace, you couldn't keep it white. So that betokened a certain um, level of, 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 um, of uh, specialness or separateness. The Hasidim wear black for the same reason that an orchestra conductor wears black. It's considered to be dignified. It's considered to be modest. Now, there are times when Western Jews will wear white. Um, that includes the wedding. Um, it includes Passover Eve. And it includes, God should protect us, um, the funeral, <laughs> right? Um, because Western Jews will wear a garment, you see at the right here, called a kittel or a sarganes, the Greek word for it, um, on the high holidays and at weddings, and um, you're buried, uh, Ashkenazi Jew is, uh, I, I imagine uh, Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews also, are buried in a white garment, often the same garment that one wore in life. When you, I've been on a burial society, so I can tell you this, when we buried people, we would bury men in their kittle that they had been married in, that they wore for years at the Seder, that they wore on, on uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but we would remove the buttons. Right? because a person doesn't need buttons where they're going, right? So that was a symbol that this is part of the next stage of the journey. But if you look here on the left, you see a woman's dress for Yom Kippur. And in the East, this is from um, Uzbekistan. Uh, you can see that women also wore on, uh, particularly on the high holidays, wore white um, in Uzbekistan and in the various stans, Afghanistan and Kazakhstan, Jewish women wore brightly colored, often green and red garments in the home on Passover. Um, the, this, it, it wasn't like Iran and Iraq uh, where you couldn't wear green 
um, you know, I don't know if they wore green garments on the street, if there were uh, Muslims around, but they certainly dressed that way. Spring colors, uh, blossoms and buds and leaves uh, in the home on Passover and then on the high holidays, white garments, right? Um, but Ashkenazi men, uh, even the ultra-Orthodox ones, normally dressed in black and white, will dress um, in white for the occasions I mentioned. Now, let's say that uh, the high priest wearing his wool and linen is an exception to the general norm. Well, in ultra-Orthodox society, the equivalent of the high priest is the Hebe, the charismatic teacher and leader of the various sects. And what you see is that while everybody else is wearing black and white, the Rebbe here, um, uh, the Rebbe of uh, Babov in the, um, yeah, on the, on the uh, left, uh, right, and in a, um, an example befitting Mark Epstein on the left, because it's covered with peacock feathers, um, a, uh, a Belza Rebbe's uh, robe, right? Um, the, the robes have come, they, they've developed in particular ways, so that, for instance, on the front, there's a velvet tab that reaches the waist, and one that reaches the ground, and then there are these bands on the sleeves. Each has a symbolic um, interpretation. Uh, and um, but what's interesting about them is that this causes them to stand out from their followers who are dressed in uniform black and white. Um, however, even within ultra orthodox fashion, there are differences and exceptions. When we think about uh, Jews dressing monolithically, let's see, say in ultra-Orthodoxy, um, we forget that, for instance, Yerushalmi Hasidim, that is ultra-Orthodox Jews who live in Jerusalem, who've been there for a long time, these are the, the, the remnants of the, the old Yeshuv in Jerusalem, have a weekday garment that's, uh, that's striped black and white. These are Reb Arles Hasidim, told us Aram Hasidim, and a Sabbath garment that's, that's gold, right? So they really stand out in a certain way. But, you know, the, the um, variety of clothes uh, in the case of uh, people who are learned and pious, right? East and West um, varies from community to community. So here's a group of young scholars in Mashhad, in Iran uh, in the early 20th century, and they are dressed in um, these uh, large fur caps uh, and turban, right? Young, young uh, scholars. Even among European, our European uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, ancestors, there were varieties. So this is the pointed sort of velvet hat, and this is the cylindrical skull cap. I actually found one of these in, a, in an old shul. Um, and, you know, I, I, the problem is that when I put it on, I look like a reconstructionist rabbi. So I, so I thought I would confuse people because, you know, that that sort of uh, cylindrical cap is back in style. Um, and, uh, and people would express their particular uniqueness within a society that required um, conformity by the details. One kind of hat, another kind of hat. Maybe these had significance. Maybe we could parse them exegetically and try to understand what they mean. Very little is written about it. Um, but one thing is true. Once uh, a man was married and received a talit or a talet, depending on what society uh, they lived in, uh, or a talis, um, often the ta talis was uh, decorated with what's called an atara, a crown. This is not the case among many Sephardim. Western Sephardim do not have atarot on their talises uh, or their talets or their taleds. Um, Ashkenazim do. And there was a type of spun gold and silver around silk thread called Spanier Arbeit, that is Spanish work, that was used to create these atarot. Sometimes they were um, fish scales sort of of, um, of silver. Um, uh, often they were uh, embroidered and made with Spanier Arbeit. And this obviously distinguished every single person, um, one uh, from the, another, even though they were all members of the sort of, um, of a scholarly um, uh, community. Um, let's talk uh, for a few minutes about um, 
the 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 talis, the talit. Um, the talit is a dodge. It is an uh, an expediency that is entered into because of the fact that the Torah commands us to make fringes on the corners of our garments, but we don't always wear a four cornered garment. So the way to observe that commandment is to put on a four cornered garment at least once a day. Some people wear ritual fringes at Talit Katan underneath their clothes, and they claim that it's absolutely required and, and uh, anybody who doesn't wear one is not an, uh, an Orthodox Jew by, by any means. Um, this is a sort of modern uh, conception. Uh, in the old time Haggadot that I look at, um, the only people wearing what's called tzitzis or arba kanfos or arba kanfot, is, the only person wearing those is the chacham, is the wise child or the wise person of the Seder, indicating that this was a measure of piety. Maimonides says, Ritem oto, uh, you should see the fringes. This means you wear them during the day. There's no specification that they need to be worn peeking out of your garment or on top of your other garment. But of course, in the rush to advertise their the Jewish side rather than the assimilating side of style, uh, of, of, of style, Jews of various um, ultra-Orthodox backgrounds have jockeyed and upped the ante. So some people wear their tzitzis hanging out. Some people wear them out, but in their pockets. That would be the, so, you know, the, the, on a scale of piety, right? The least pious person in the eyes of an ultra-Orthodox Jew is somebody who wears his, his tzitzis inside, right? Um, then there's a person who wears them out, but tucked into his pockets. Then there's a person who wears them long out, right? Uh, completely out. And then there's a person who wears the talit katan over their clothes, right? And that's the sort of most manifest or, um, or uh, uh, apparent way of doing it. But this has been an argument that's been going on since uh, at least the second century. Talitot were of various materials, but especially prized for elegance in Italy was the silk talet. And if you look me up, um, if you Google me, um, don't Google too much because you, you'll grow hair on your palms. Uh, but if you Google me, um, you will find that there's an article that was written years ago in the forwards called um, something like this $500 talit, right? And it's about the revival of the silk talit. You may have a silk talit that's actually made of polyester. But in Italy, in an earlier period, they, there were factories that actually wove um, talitot out of silk, including the fringes. The fringes on a talit have a variety of um, meanings and designations. Um, uh, sometimes they represent through the knots and the tyings and the, and the, uh, the way they're, um, they revolve around the central core. Uh, and the fringes, they represent the number of commandments, uh, traditionally 613. Sometimes they stand for the name of God. So you have Yod, that's 10 twirls, right? Then a knot, hey, five twirls, Vav, six, right? And then another hey, five, right? That's what Western Sephardim do, right? Uh, different communities have different practices. Also, how many holes or eyelets um, the, the, the tzitzit are hung from, um, and the material, right? Obviously, if you have a wool talit, you can't have linen tzitzit. Um, there's a question about silk. Is silk appropriate for uh, tzitzit? The Italian Jews said yes and made beautiful, beautiful tzitzit. The traditional stripes on the talit vary in width, in configuration between uh, Sephardim and Ashkenazim and Hasidic Jews and Yemenite Jews, sometimes they're very colorful, right? So the invention of the rainbow talis, talis is not something that was invented by uh, renewal Judaism in the 21st century. I'll show you some, um, I can show you some Yemenite uh, uh, examples, um, for instance, uh, this one, right, that are, that are extremely colorful. This could be a, a Southwest um, Native American uh, 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 or Mexican serape, right? Um, Yemenite Jews loved red, uh, but they also, here's some Yemenite Jews, they also wore traditional uh, stripings on the talus. The stripes were supposed to represent or replace 
the blue thread, the Tzichelet thread in the tzitzit. The, the, the issue of Tzichelet is very interesting. The Talmud says, the, the Bible says, you should put a blue thread on the corners of your fringes, on your four-cornered garments. The Talmud says, why? Because Tzichelet domel ayam, vayam domel rakia, v'rakia gam hu domel kiseh ha-kavod, v'kiseh ha-kavod domel even ha-sapir, which means this color blue, is the color of the sea, and the sea reflects the sky, and the sky reflects the divine throne, and the divine throne reflects the sapphire pavement through which Moses saw the image of God on the divine throne. So it's a very, it's intended to, to, and that's my favorite, why, why to call it that blue, sky blue, or a darker blue, there's a debate, is my favorite color. But of course, the process of making Tichelet was lost in history, and now most of our tzitzit are white, except for the Radziner Hasidim, whose Rebbe was a marine biologist and claimed to have rediscovered the true Tichelet and started, um, started using it in taluses. And then in Israel, there's a sort of more scientific approach to it. A fascinating, fascinating story. If Ari ever invites me back again, I'll, I'll give a talk called True Blue, the story of Tichelet. Um, but suffice it to say that while a blue stripe evokes the Tichelet, it didn't, as I, as I mentioned to you before, have to be um, necessarily blue. And in fact, some of the most beautiful Tichelet that survive don't have stripes at all. This is a gold damask uh, Tichelet from, um, from uh, uh, Germany, which has uh, what's called a lining. You can see it here. Um, and that was to when you put the talus over your head because the talus forms a, a tent for in which you may pray and have some uh, pri privacy, or if you're British, um, some privacy. Um, that, that part is called, uh, the, the, the band is called the atara. The corners are called the pinot, the corners. And that part that you see here with beautiful embroidery, um, that's called the lining that goes over your head. Um, so, you know, when you see a bunch of people with Spanier Arbeit Talitot, and, and you know, it's quite a it's quite a um, a stunning uh, and fascinating sight. Um, there is, it must be uh, it must be stated, a variety of headgear among Jews, right? So hundreds of different uh, uh, yarmulke types. Often yarmulke means means a uh, a hat from yarmulke, right? Um, but uh, in the Bukharian community, you know, people say, I have a Bukharian kippah. Well, there's all different kinds of Bukharian kippahs, right? These are hats that are um, usually part of the wider society and um, adopted and adapted by Jews sometimes with inscriptions, et cetera, et cetera. There are other kinds of daily hats that Jews would wear. So um, these um, kashket hats, casket hats, right? They, they're, they're sort of typical um, East European um, uh, uh, sort of lower middle class, right? So you'll see these in old photographs um, uh, in Poland. And then look at this family. This is a Temani, a Yemenite family who emigrated from to Israel. So the father with the long peot, all the kids have long peot, um, with, this, with this high conical hat, one son with like a large kippah, and the youngest son with a kova tembo, right? A, 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 a typical kibbutz type of hat. So hats are, are, are quite the thing and, um, and they distinguish Jewish men, but of course they also distinguish Jewish women. But oh, what hats, the variety of hats among Jewish women in Algeria and Tunisia and Jerba, I mean, um, are incredible. Uh, and they really, um, they evoke uh, medieval Spanish models, right? Um, so uh, this is the Sarma from Algeria, and you can see that it's a, a wire matrix, right, over which fabric was uh, wrapped. So there's, they're like the quote unquote, my daughter used to call them princess hats, right? Um, women's, ha women's headgear is uh, fast, a fascinating variety. Also, I talked to you um, about the fact that some women wore their dowry on their heads. Right, so here is a Temania, um, uh, I, mean, I mean, a gerbin, uh, this, this, this young woman is a gerbil. Um, uh, she is wearing a bridal costume. She's obviously too young to be a mature bride, but she may be betrothed or it may be Purim, who knows? Um, and she's got all her wealth on her head, right? So 
the hat for women does two things. It's, it's, it, on the one hand, conceals the hair of a married woman, since the hair of a, of a married woman is deemed to be an enticement, erva, right? Um, it means a limb, right? So it has, the hair has sexuality, so it must be hidden when a woman is married. Um, and uh, there are a variety of ways of doing it, but this certainly calls attention to the hair. In fact, even though you don't see the hair on these young women, the variety of headgear underneath veils is truly, truly um, astounding, right? These are horned head ornaments uh, on two very young brides. Again, look at the wonderful embroidery and ornamentation. Um, an older woman wearing um, um, a headdress that has a wig sort of attached to it, right? Um, in the East, women would uh, closely crop their heads, but not shave them as Hasidic women do. And a variety of different kerchiefs and um, built up uh, what we call tichels in Ashkenaz, right? So these are Jewish women wearing the, the halabi um, um, uh, headgear. Uh, there's been a resurgence among uh, settler women uh, of a certain kind of turban looking hat that resembles these in some ways. But, you know, for a, for a um, construct that doesn't call attention, you're supposed to uh, not call attention to the hair, uh, there are wonderful and creative ways of covering the head um, for women. Um, sometimes, again, with a variety of silver ornaments, uh, such as this from Southern Morocco, um, sometimes with false hair pieces, right? And then in the West, uh, very much like the other people around uh, in the 18th century bonnets, right? Like you might see on Martha Washington. Um, but what's interesting about these, uh, these bonnets is that uh, sometimes like the men's talit atarot, they are worked with Spanier arbeit and pearls. So they can be quite elaborate. And this woman, who's a bit of a phobicina, I have to say, um, I wouldn't want to get her, her wrong side, a wealthy woman with seed pearls in her, um, her cap. In fact, this cap, which is in the, um, it's called, it's called a, um, a shtem, uh, uh, shtem tichel, um, uh, is, is actually the cap that we see in this, in this uh, painting, which is interesting um, and unusual. Um, the, 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 there were um, uh, a variety of approaches in the East to veiling. This did not occur in the West, except in the case of brides. In fact, in, in the case of ultra-Orthodox brides in the West, they not only wear a normal um, uh, 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 veil, but, um, uh, but a double opaque veil. Um, the custom of veiling the brides goes back to the book of Genesis and the marriage of Jacob and Rachel. Um, but in, uh, in various places in Eastern Europe, there were, uh, this is, this is Georgia, right? So it's, it's, um, it's, it's out there. It's not, right. It's out there. It's not, uh, Moscow. It's not Warsaw. Um, here's a veil that was worn on the back of the head by married women with fake hair. Right. So the, you know, people often ask, aha, so if they are not supposed to show their hair, why do they show fake hair? All right. It's a very good question. I'm sure somebody's asked it in the um, in the chat. Uh, and we might uh, discuss that as we go on. Um, but you see that this is a rudimentary veil, almost like a bridal veil. But there was much more serious veiling going on in the further east you got in Morocco, et cetera, et cetera. And unlike um, many of the uh, veils for Muslim women, which were solid color and dark, Jewish women, when they veiled either just their hair or sometimes as we'll see their faces, um, used uh, fabrics of a variety of amazing colors, like uh, these from Jerba uh, and Tunisia in the mid 20th century. Um, and, you know, together with, with belts and clothing that was, uh, you know, if you went to an Orthodox shul or an ultra-Orthodox shul in a red polka dot dress, they, 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 they throw you out. But in the East, this was very, very typical. And this love of ornament extends to also to men's clothes. 
so that um, these are a variety of belts, uh, women's uh, and men's. Um, this is what I particularly uh, like. This is a groom's belt with the name in Hebrew, right? Um, Eliyahu ibn Rachamim Hadad, Eli Hadad. Um, and it's just, it just fanciful, imaginative uses of red and green and colors that you don't expect from people who are, you know, uh, very, very religiously observant. So not everybody is dressed in, um, in black and white. Now, um, oh, I didn't mean to, to go there. I want to just um, point out a, um, a, uh, a, just a fact that's probably unknown to a lot of people which is that in certain places, in Baghdad, uh, in Iraq, and in Iran, um, women, Jewish women, went veiled. Sometimes the face was revealed, sometimes the bottom part of the face was revealed, but often, um, you know, with complete veiling. Now, why was this? Was it because the Muslims forced Jewish women to dress that way? No. It was because in the times and places where such veils were employed, that was the mode. That's the way people dress. Just like I'm wearing this shirt because I live in 21st century Poughkeepsie, and this is the way we dress um, in uh, this, this uh, itzar in Baghdad, uh, this sort of full veiling, or um, um, this uh, Afghanistan uh, full Head wrap and um, and veil, uh, and um, and uh, when when women left the house in Afghanistan, they wrapped themselves in a full black chador, right? Um, Iranian women, Persian women, uh, a similar thing. At the same time, in the same kind of general area uh, of Iraq, uh, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, right? Um, uh, the same area where the Jewish dress looked so Muslim, it continued its uh, assimilation, its tofu-like qualities in the sense that women wore trousers. That was the women's dress, right? Um, it, I can't tell you how many, <laughs> how many fights um, my, uh, my uh, you know, uh, observant aunts had with their young daughters in the 70s uh, about whether they would wear pants and jeans in particular and form-fitting things. Granted, these trousers are not exactly form-fitting, but because they were the common women's dress here in uh, Uzbekistan and here in um, Yemen, they became the thing for Jews as well. And we see it, you know, in contemporary life. Here's a uh, a photograph of um, uh, a couple living in uh, the West Bank. Um, and the husband's wearing jeans, as you can see, and a big kippah and wild hair with long sinsis and beard and jeans, right? Uh, with long payas and beard and jeans and sinsis out. And the woman has her head covered. She's wearing a fairly form-fitting top and she's wearing pants under a skirt. Now it's interesting that pants under a skirt is the typical dress of Arab, Muslim, and Christian schoolgirls throughout this region, right? So again, you know, the question, do women wear pants? Do they not wear pants? It's an open question. The answer is yes, right? It depends where and when. And the relationship I think here to the wider cultures, jeans, form-fitting top, right? Yet, sits this, big yarmulke, um, turban-like, uh, you know, uh, head covering, um, and then this combination of pants and skirt that comes from, not from the the uh, the West, but from, you know, uh, Yerushalmi Muslim or uh, Arab general uh, schoolgirl look, uh, just shows how this particular configuration of assimilation with distinction continues and is maintained. And so uh, Ari might have some questions and we will uh, then let you guys go back to cleaning behind the stove. Thank you for taking us on a sartorial view through um, Jewish clothing customs. Maybe unshare the screen so people can see you. There was a, a lot of discomfort when you oh. had the screen on black. Just wanna make oh. sure you know that. When you had nothing up there, people yeah. were freaking out. That's the most yeah. comments I got. 
Right, right, right. People I, left, yeah. they came back, they were really worried. So I'm glad that they can see you now. Yes, I'm still here. Um, one of the oldest, uh, someone brought up a question about clothing in the Bible. I know you kind of went more sure. contemporary history and they talked about Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat, which stands right. out in our tradition. Do you have anything to say uh, about that? So um, we don't really know if it was a Technicolor at all. It says Kitonet Pasim, which means a coat. That was, with... That's the name of the musical, but go ahead. No, I know. Listen, way, way back, many centuries ago, not, not long after the Bible began, Joseph lived in the land of Canaan, a, a fine example of a family man. Okay? Which is, by the way, how we got to Egypt for the whole Passover story. So I'm just trying exactly, to connect things here. Exactly. So, so Joseph's coat in the Bible is called Kitonet Pasim. So Pasim either means stripes or checks, <laughs> right? We don't know that it was colorful at all, but this is important. It was distinctive. And as I said, two aspects of Jewish clothes, right? Um, assimilationist and distinctive, and what got Joseph into trouble, his father's favoritism, right, was that this coat was distinctive from the coats of the brothers, right? So certainly beged in Hebrew, beged in Hebrew is related to begida, which means treachery. So clothes make the person, but clothes also conceal and deceive, right? So I can dress in a certain way and it will deceive you. One of the laws that I left out in the Bible is, uh, is that a man should not put on a woman's clothes and vice versa, right? Because that's viewed as not being true to one's true essence, right? And that's something we need to negotiate in our, in our uh, uh, trans world now. Right. It's it's, you know, a lot of what goes on on the right is, uh, well, it says in the Bible, right, you can't even wear a woman's clothes if you're a man. So changing your sex, well, you know, um, there's there's a lot of emotion attached to, to clothes. And um, I actually have a wonderful page in the Golden Haggadah in which the center of the page, there are four different illustrations and each illustration involves a garment over which some treachery occurs. The brothers bring the bloodied coat of Joseph to their father. Potiphar's wife, um, uh, you know, uh, Joseph uh, uh, flees from Potiphar's wife and she grabs his garment, right? So Beged and Begida, clothes are maximally treacherous, minimally tricky. Very nice. We also did a program about biblical clothing with David Moster. So I'll, I'll put that link in, which focused oh, on the true. older clothing. Uh, regarding the newer clothing, let's focus on the kippah for a second, because it really is a, a much later historical yeah. item. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about when you think it came into sure. the fore sure. and um, where it may be mentioned, the earliest mention of the kippah? Uh, my mud brother's kippah. <laughs> yeah, I, I would assume. By the way, if we if if, if Jesus does return and he sees people in a single wearing a kippah, he'll have no idea what they're wearing, right? Well, I mean, anybody I, from that period. I, I chose Jesus, but who knows? He was a I think. Jewish, he, I think. Uh, I, look, I, look. A kippah is a convenient um, way of covering the head, right? Um, and it's become so uh, de rigueur that very from people go out with a kippah and a hat, right? Is it required? No, you know, I, 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 look, here, here's the history of the kippah. It goes back to Jacob, our ancestor. Did you know that? How do we know that Jacob, our ancestor, went out, walked with the kippah? I'll tell you. It says, Vayetze Yaakov, and Jacob went out. Now, would Jacob have gone out without a kippah? <laughs> gotcha, Ari Katz. I know, I know, I know, I know. All right, no, it's a good joke. Um, it's better in Yiddish. But um, so, so the fact is this, the ones, the earliest ones we have are from the 18th century, right? Uh, we don't have kippot earlier than that. We do have images of people wearing kippot Jews in 17th century prints, but they are wearing them because the people, those people are academics and academics wore what Protestant and Catholic theologians and expositors of canon law war, which was a zucchetto, right? A, 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 like the Pope wears. The Pope wears what's called a zucchetto. Why is it called a zucchetto? Because like a zucchini, it has a little 
It has a little stem sticking out of it, right? So Jews wore that as well, right? And, and it became part of Jewish clothing. Is it required to wear a yarmulke? I'm not a rabbi, I don't play one on television, but I would say no, right? The Shulchan Aruch says that, that you should not walk for amos. You shouldn't walk, you know, an ama is from your, your elbow to your big finger, so your mileage may vary, but you shouldn't walk, let's say, you know, five feet, six feet without your head covering, right? But why? Because it's a measure, measure of piety, right? So, you know, I don't know. I always wear a kippah wherever I go, but um, some people take it off because they don't want to be identified as Jews. And that's perfectly understandable. It doesn't make them bad Jews. But the kippah has a hi history that goes back to the 18th century when it was the characteristic garb of learned people during the Enlightenment. Jews took it up. But Ari, I'm not sure that, that a first century Jew, Jesus or anybody else, would be astounded by kippah because you know that in Africa and the Middle East, there are a lot of people wear a close sort of cap under their turban. So Jews would have worn that as well, I, I imagine, if they wore turbans or kafia like head covering, right? Shmatas, we call them, on their heads, right? Um, and and they, they would have, um, they would have uh, had, um, uh, you know, that under, under bit. Uh, so yeah, that's what I- Okay, so last two questions. Let's focus on the talit. Um, yes. What you've shown us today is how Jews are tofu, and you like to say that, and we've absorbed the um, clothing culture from the cultures that we've lived in. Um, right. But the talit, so I, I guess the question is fringes. Right. Where if where does that come from, from your perspective? So in a, so in Assyrian Babylonian, um, you know, uh, um, uh, how would you say it? Reliefs, low relief, bas relief. Um, uh, you will see on kings and heroes that the that there are fringes all around the sides of their garments. Um, obviously, uh, this is uh, this is a um, uh, it's a um, a decorative element. Uh, it seems uh, there are some theories that in in antiquity um, it was uh, it was a, a measure of uh, uh, sort of royal dignity to wear especially long fringes on your clothes. Um, I think it emerges from a decorative uh, impulse, um, but it, then it becomes uh, very much, uh, um, uh, very much connected with religious requirement. And that's 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 as much as I can say about fringes. I think they were present in the ancient world and like many things in Jewish culture, they were sacralized. Um, I want to point out to our public um, that uh, one of the best articles uh, about Jewish uh, clothes and Jewish fashion is by a talented young writer named M. Seely Katz. Uh, it, the title is The Enduring Trajectory of Jewish Fashion. And I'm sure that uh, Ari Katz, uh, relation, um, uh, usually you say no relation, but in this case you say relation, uh, we'll put it up uh, in the links. Uh, and I, I, wanna, I wanna say that I, I owe um, uh, a, a lot of what I thought about this to, um, uh, to, to, to M's uh, cogitation. And in that article, uh, they have, um, they, they show the black obelisk of uh, Shalmaneser III, which shows Israelites with fringes. So we see the earliest depictions of fringes, but they're just fringes. They're what we call gedilim. They haven't developed into these tzitzit that have specific religious meaning. So thank you. And I will share my child's article. Thank you. My oldest, who's looking for a job, by the way, in the online fashion description industry or whatever. Okay. Um, last question. So have there been exhibits about like Jewish clothing where you'd go in material and, and, and you'd see like all the clothing you've seen us, you, you've shown us where people could see this a, but B most importantly, what is the oldest talit we have? You know, we have old text. Do we have something like the oldest talit that so someone we knows? Some, so we have some garments from, um, from, from, uh, from roughly Syrian garments. They may be from Dur Europis, which has one of the early, had one of the earliest, um, surviving decorated synagogues. We have fragments of garments that could be talitot, but really the earliest ones we have are 
um, German and Italian ones from um, from uh, what's it called um, uh, uh, the eighteenth century, maybe the seventeenth century. The thing is this: garments are worn. I have, I'll tell you, I have several Teletot. I have a beautiful Italian silk one. I have a large, completely white silk with gold for the high holidays, which was woven also in Italy. I have a beautiful Talit with a, with a lining and with Venetian corners. But every day I get up and I put on, for Shachris or morning davening, I put on my grandfather's Talit, which is completely ripped to pieces. It's it's basically in shreds. It's a, it's a wool talus, but it was his and he wore it and I see where he repaired it. And, um, you know, clothes go. That's just one, you know, my grandfather died in the in the 80s, right? Um, and it's a, I'm not going to be able to give it as a functional garment necessarily uh, to my to my kids. So uh, we don't really have very many early things. But what there is, you can see in the Israel Museum, wonderful exhibit in the, in, the, uh, in the Division of Jewish Ethnography and Culture, and also the Jewish Museum in New York. In fact, most Jewish museums have a section in which the local um, uh, special, specialities, let's say, of, of sartorial culture is represented. And it's to me, it's always fascinating because you see these empty suits of clothes and you imagine the people that inhabited them and it's very touching. And it's especially wonderful when you can benefit from the labors of these ethnographical um, uh, expeditions that have traveled to and, um, and uh, photographed uh, a variety of, um, of examples of, of these cultures. So I'm really uh, happy to share this with you. And on May 7th, we will talk about the Jewish home, uh, what was in the Jewish home, uh, what characterizes the Jewish home in terms of material culture. I warn you that because the Jews are a parapathetic people, I didn't say pathetic, pathetic is pathetic. Parapathetic means wandering. There's not much that I can show you, but what I can show you is very exciting. And I wanna talk about what makes a Jewish home uh, in a more theoretical way uh, next time. So um, we'll talk about what we can learn about the Jewish life from the Jewish home as depicted in art and where we can find uh, some of these lost treasures of historical Jewish urban civilizations that are not now gone. So that is Monday, May 7th um, at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Time, and whenever Israel time or Uzbekistan time. So. Actually, 4 p.m. Pacific. Oh, but sorry, 4 p.m. I guess math, you know, we'll work right. on that. Math is not So no, wishing right. you a Chag Sameach and hopefully you hope, whatever you wear at the Seder, I hope it's uh, appropriate for you. I, I, I do get dressed up. I'll show them oh. my outfit. So I usually have live animals like goats in our Seder, but that's yeah. a different story. Because every day is, is Purim true. for our cats. Every no, day it's not Purim. Purim. It's a and goat holiday. We don't eat the goats, though. We do a normal Seder. We're I will share a photo. I have, they, are, they are real goats. Everybody take care. Okay. Go take back care. to your cleaning and cooking. Bye, everybody. Great to see you. Bye-bye.